Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Hi, Katie. Thank you for being with us today and welcome to the Ancestral Health Today podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. How are you doing? I am doing... I'm doing well. I mean, maybe a different answer to that is too long for a podcast, <laughs> but you know, Still I'm, free. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to like probably all the listeners manage my well being in a time and place that doesn't support it very easily. So I, I deal with that. I have ups and downs. And so, so yeah, that's, that's how I'm feeling is just looking around at that again and going, Oh, time to make some more changes or adjustments. Yes. That's, that's a great thing to be conscious of. And I think that's something that all of us really need to work hard of because we have such a mismatch from what our biology and what our just mental health needs to, you know, the, the life that we live today. Yeah. And it's hard not to always say you're fine <clears throat> when someone asks you, but I think maybe if we could answer more honestly and, uh, you know, like, where are you, where are you today in, in navigating you and your spaces? And it might, we might be able to articulate it and get more support that way. So yes, I am, I'm tired. <laughs> I am tired. <laughs> that's a, that's a really great way to reframe it. And maybe in that reframe we can also build more community you know well, and let people know where we are and just help each other That's more something honest that... yeah more honest community like more uh it's more intimate right you're more a little bit more vulnerable by saying what's actually going on with you someone can allow people to respond yeah absolutely so talking about community let's have our community get to know you a little bit better um, tell us about yourself, where you're coming from, what got, got you here, um, and anything that you would like to share with the audience. Well, hello, everyone in the <clears throat> Ancestral Health Symposium community. I mean, uh, yes, it's um, my name's Katie Bowman, and I am coming to you literally from Washington State. And figuratively, I'm coming to you from uh, a, a particular path or set of choices that I've made about what I wanted to study when I was in school, which uh, was movement, um, and then the different choices that I've made about how I've set up my lifestyle uh, to incorporate more ancestral. I've spoken at the Ancestral Health Symposium before. <clears throat> on different things having to do with movement and lifestyle, <clears throat> movement rich lifestyle and movement rich parenting. And, and that's, uh, I guess, sort of my platform from which I speak, talking about the importance of movement and maybe offering a broader perspective on movement beyond exercise. That's something that I've been talking about for 10 years now or more. It's scary, scary to think of, but, um, yeah, actually, I think I was at the ancestral health symposium in 2012, if not 2013. Yes. So it's been 10, yep. you know, it's been 10 years. So yeah, um, that's sort of how I approach life is thinking a lot about movement. I'm a biomechanist for those that don't know that's someone who studies, uh, the overlap uh, or the intersection of biology and mechanics, which is a, a branch of physics that deals with just simple things like levers and pressures and the way our body is affected by the mechanical environment that we create through positioning and through movement. Wonderful. And what brought you to uh, wanting <laughs> to become a biomechanist? I, yeah, I did not start on the path of, I don't know how many people wanted to be biomechanists, but um, in short, I started studying math and physics first. Those were just natural interests of mine. I always did like general mechanics, like putting things together. And also I've told this story on podcasts before. I 
was always really interested in the Tin Man of the Wizard of Oz when I was a younger child. Like the thought of seeing the joints on top of the way that costume was designed in that movie. I just, I was really attracted to that early on. And I spent a lot of time just thinking of my own hinges. I used to always ponder sitting in a rocking chair, like how am I making this rocking chair move? That was something I did a lot as a kid. And I can see it in my own kids now. They have a lot of um, insights that they, that they feed me just like, Hey, I, I can move my kneecap. Hey, I can move this eyebrow, but you know, like, and I think kids naturally do that, but they're very vocal about it. And I just really remember that and never really stopped. I never really stopped just being at, amazed at what my body could do. And then when I got into to university, I was sort of bored in math and physics. And I also was an emerging mover. I was pretty um, sedentary and studious um, through most of my childhood. Although I'll put a footnote there. When I say that, my level of sedentarism was nothing like the kids today. Like I was still a pretty active child, like kids were in the seventies and eighties, like riding bikes and being outside all the time. Like we didn't watch TV or spend a lot of time inside, but relatively speaking, like I would prefer to read most of the time. But when I was eight, six, you know, 16 and 17 and 18, I just slowly started to move more. And then when I was at university, my, it, my emerging interest in movement overlapped with my boredom studying math and physics. And I found this department, <clears throat> excuse me, called kinesiology, which is the study of human movement. And I found a, an option or what was called an emphasis at that time within that degree for biomechanics, which I had already taken all the math and physics for in the first two years of my degree. So I changed departments and I finished up in biomechanics. And then I went to graduate school to continue to study that, that option or that emphasis. And, and I had no conscious memory of making a choice to, to do that as a job, but it was more like just, I was really interested in, in pursuing and embodying, uh, that, that the information that I was gathering while I was, um, following that, those degree paths. And so here I am a biomechanist and I don't really know how I got here other than just a nice accident, I guess. That's amazing. Um, how did you become entrenched into the concept of nutritious movement? If I were to, you know, look at the majority of people that work in this environment, they may go to work for, you know, a large shoe company or to work for a company that emphasizes braces or things of that nature, more of the fixing the problems at the end rather than preventing. And you speak a lot about nutritious movements. So can you break down what that concept is um, and how that particular concept evolved for you? Well, <clears throat> that's a very long journey that actually started on the first day of graduate school for me. And so this is a very personal story, but I grabbed, I was, I grabbed like a free magazine on campus that had an advertisement. It was LA yoga magazine, which is like a freebie sort of like alternative health magazine. And there was an ad in there for earth shoes. So earth shoes was a brand of shoes that instead of having the heel raised above the toes, they had it the other way around. The toes were elevated over the heels. And this was a pair of, this was a style of shoes and a brand of shoes that had been around since the seventies. Oh, wow. But the way that they had structured this full page ad in the back was a diagram um, of the orientation of the rest of the body parts. So again, it's, it's like a callback to how I used to look at the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz, where you could see where the hinges were. So the way that they did this side-by-side -side graphic in shoes, I was just like, that's really interesting to me. Like, I don't even really remember thinking, thinking um, I remember noticing it and like feeling it go in 
but I didn't really mull it at that point. But then like a half an hour later, I stepped into the first seminar of, of my first day of graduate school. And it was this really awesome biomechanics seminar where it was led by, um, Dr. William Whiting, who eventually became my mentor, um, and my thesis advisor. And it was a class where everyone could just talk about and work on the thing in biomechanics that interested them the most. And so he went around the room and was asking what everyone was interested in. It was, all, it was mostly the things that you see, again, it was like biomechanics and athletics, you know, that you're like talking about uh, designing exercise equipment, orthopedics, does, does, um, designing um, support uh, for a variety of reasons, usually, usually disability, but sometimes like post-surgery. So more of like more medical, less athletic, so mm -hmm. athletics and medicine. And I was still sort of look, looking in my mind at this graphic from an earth shoe ad where they were talking about like the natural way to walk. And, and I just said, I had just said, I'm really interested in and again, I've never even met any of these people in my life or this professor mm -hmm. before. Like I'm interested in the way, like our orientation of parts or our posture. I don't even think I had the word alignment really. Mm. Like if I use it now about how that differs around the world and what are the ailments that arise depending on this sort of orientation of parts or the postures with which we carry ourselves. And I remember... I can just remember, um, you know, the teacher in front going like, huh, okay. And, and so like, that was always my, the, everything that I chose to do during those two years was always a, an extreme outlier of, again, the sports and, and, and medicine or th therapeutic type stuff. It was always, um, more of an anthropological cross-cultural perspective. So I've just always been interested in, in a real broader picture. Um, so, so the second part of your question is like, where, how does movement nutrition come out of that? That that's like a 15 year journey that I'm still mm -hmm. on, but it was in trying to, again, back in, in the school and in the kinesiology department and in, in uh, movement science, you're, you're taught that there are three types of human movement that there's um, athletics, fitness, and dance, that those are the three types oh, wow. of human movements. Like that's, <laughs> that's in textbooks. And I just had this like cross-cultural, these cross-cultural insights going like, I think that there might be more than that. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, because like, where would we put, I was already like, I really focused on pelvic health, pelvic biomechanics, low back pain and um, how all the parts of the pelvis work for vaginal expulsion during delivery of a child. Mm -hmm. Like I was just really interested in like, not so much the pitching arm, uh, uh, but what was happening in this really mundane thing that so many people on the planet do. And, and again, it's that broad perspective, right? It's like, it's like that, this is what I'm interested in. And so all my papers were on sort of obnoxious things like that, which I didn't think were obnoxious, but, but, but the, but the staff, the teaching staff, the mentoring staff had never really, I think had a student who come, came through interested in, in those types of things. So, um, as I began to look at movement, not in the fitness dance or athletic lens, but as something that all, all bodies, you know, outside of disability, but like generally speaking that our anatomy has evolved to, um, expect because of the movements that were around for a long time. Like I just started to really be interested in quantifying <clears throat> what these, you know, so-called natural movements are and arguably it might be time for different language around that, but whatever the language is, these movements that are like the backbone of all of the people before us that got us to this point, 
that are rapidly falling off, sort of unprecedentedly, unprecedentedly mm -hmm. falling off, even though they have been trending, movement's been trending downward for a long time. It's accelerated now at this point of trying to reframe movement using the language that we use for dietary nutrients. So mm. that, that came up for me like maybe six or seven years ago because, because I don't, I don't think many people even recognize what a nutrient is like what, it, what makes something a nutrient. So that was what I was interested in fleshing out a handful of years ago. And it's like, Oh, well, what makes something a nutrient is that in its absence, there are predictable things that arise in the body. And when that compound is introduced, those symptoms go away. <clears throat> so, so nutrients are defined in hindsight after a period of loss and then targeted reintroduction, usually scientific reintroduction where different things have been tried, trying to figure out the right thing. And I was like, oh, well, we've been doing that same thing for movement without realizing it. It's more of a natural experiment, but, um, I just took that same nutrient framework and the idea of there being different types of nutrients that relate to each other, macronutrients and micronutrients, um, and saying it goes the same for movement. <clears throat> and we have, we do have a movement diet. It's just the compounds aren't chemical that you're ingesting them. You're not, you're not ingesting chemicals to get the chemistry inside, but with Movie or DNA, which is a book I wrote, it's the same thing where ingesting isn't the right word, but the loads or the squishes that are happening to your body when you're in your mechanical environment go on to create chemicals within the cell. So in that way, it's very similar to ingesting either orally or through sunlight, some external compounds. So I call them all inputs now. You've got your dietary inputs, your sunlight inputs, and your mechanical inputs. And then those are all things that you need. And when you don't get certain ones, there are certain predictable things that arise. And then there are inputs that you can do to target and make some of those things dissipate. That's a great explanation. And those mechanical inputs also affect the other inputs and how they yeah, affect the body. And that's a great definition of the nutritious movement framework because we can look at it from the lens of preserving that function and not letting that deteriorate over time, um, which is what unfortunately is happening a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you framed it very well within people who are able to move, there's no disability involved. That decline over time is just, um, it has accelerated significantly. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit more about more of the concept of how that movement has evolved, or in this case, egressed <laughs> in, a, in, a, yeah. in a way. It has, you know, it has gone backwards, rather, um, and how that um, evolution has affected everything that we do and our environment nowadays. Well, so there's, there is no really going back. And I think halfway through my career, you know, I was always very interested in studying movement, studying movement. And about halfway through, I realized, oh, the piece that I don't really understand is sedentarism, is, is the, the absence of movement. So to thoroughly study movement, one needs to really understand sedentarism. Because if our bodies... Um, require so much movement and they do how is it possible to get ourselves in a state which could be the time and the place um where so little movement is being done like i just think as far as um other things in nature like how do you get yourself so far away from having your needs met Mm. And so that's, I mean, that too was a right around the time when I was writing Move Your DNA, which was looking at as we've moved forward in time <clears throat> and have become more technologically advanced, many of our advancements are, they're not usually framed this way, 
but they are creating technologies that allow you to meet some need without the movement that used to be packaged or bundled up with that need. So we would say a lot of our conven a lot of our technologies are about convenience, right? They save time. But you still need all that movement. So they didn't really save you time because all you're left with is the end of the day and guess what? You didn't get any of your movement done. So that's kind of a huge inconvenience. It's the fact that <clears throat> nothing in your day moved you any longer. So now when you've when you're done you know, with all the things that you've done in the day, you still have four hours of movement that needed to be done. And guess what? There's no more time for it because we are in sort of a fixed <clears throat> time situation. So one thing I like to say about the body or about our DNA, you know, there's a lot of talk about this, you know, blueprint that we have in our DNA or um, these needs that we come with for movement paradoxically, we also have alongside this tremendous capacity for a need for a movement, generally speaking, is equally all of the software that has us not move as much as, as often as we can, right? So mm. like we're always trying to conserve energy. That is equally as natural as is our requirement for movement. So Very what do true. we do with this? So we've got this tremendous paradox that we have to deal with, which is we, like all things, like all other living things on the planet, depend on our environment. We depend on our environment, not only for the compounds that we extract from it, but for the situation or the pressures that it creates for us in order to get what we need. So we have radically modified our environment. And really, if you could think about, and I think people who are listening to this podcast probably already have a little bit of this framework. If you could think about your physical situation as not only something going on or going wrong with your body, but maybe your body expressing itself correctly based on the environment that it is in, then we could a lot more attention or energy to modifying our environment for greater change than simply trying to modify our behavior within the identical environment. So I'm a big fan of modifying the environment so that you just moving through it um, creates that environmental pressure that gets you the behavior and then the resultant adaptations that you would that you're seeking. So what do you think are the biggest factors in our environment that either <laughs> facilitate or impede? movement uh, and we can oh go into cultural the amount of time that people work you know go in any direction that you can uh, because there are a lot of them it's all of it i mean it's really it's it's all of it um i can tell you about some of the modifications that i've made so that there's like a two, there's two level payoff. One, you can hear how I've modified the environment. And then two, I guess it's which part of the environment I have deemed as something that needs addressing. So most simply, uh, we ha have really reduced the number of chairs or seats in our house. And so like, I know that sounds, I know that it's just, I know how it sounds to people hearing it for the first time. And again, on this podcast, it's a totally different audience who are like, yes, high five. I get it. But for other podcasts, it's like you are saying nonsense. But but again, that's that cross-cultural perspective in me, which is our perception of like what humans do with their bodies is sort of an outlier compared to a lot of other humans on the planet. So one, just I'm not even talking about going back into time. I'm talking about today 
June 27th, 2023, just go to a different part of the planet and you're going to see radically different physical behavior than what we've got going on right now in pod, podcast landia, right? The land of podcasts. So, um, so modifying, modifying furniture to make it so it's at different heights. Like one of the things that we've got built into sort of the fabric of our society is that all chairs are at the same height and that you people are really just going from different chair seat to chair seat, whether it's at work or in their car or home. And so just modifying that a little bit more. So you're varying up your body use. So it looks a lot more like not only your own ancestry, but other people around the planet right now today, right? right. We're just using our bodies a little bit more. Um, and then I do think I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, but I would say today, um, the smartphone environment is probably superseding the chair situation that we've got mm. going on now. Um, and it's staggering to think that 10 years ago, this wasn't even a thing, but it has become ubiquitous. And I don't even, don't only mean across all people in podcast landia, but also throughout the day. Like there's not even like, oh, this is something that happens at this discrete time in the day. It's diffused throughout the day. It's gonna yes. be diffused throughout a lifetime. Um, every day of the year, right? Like, so that this, this is just, again, more novelty, more novelty. Mm -hmm. And, and we don't have good use practices. And I'm not even talking about the content that you're consuming, which is its own set of, other set. I, yes, that's a whole other set. I'm simply <laughs> yes. talking about the mechanical nutrients that are found during the periods of time you're spending with this, using this device. Um, and of course, the nice thing is that technology, I'm talking about smartphone again, doesn't require you be in any particular physical position to use it. We have simply stepped into using it sort of mindlessly as far mm. as both, you know, as far as we didn't realize that there's a lot of options or choices to be made around how we're positioned, you know, and like, what is our relationship to movement and position with this device? So, so the good news is like, I, I spent a lot of time working on trying to create good use practices, things to consider. Um, of course, addressing volume the, of use time is another way to do it, but yeah, definitely, definitely the smartphone is, a. Um, a thing. And so it's creating a good use set of practices that do um, address volume, or I like to call it, I call it digital minimalism because someone else smarter than me called it digital minimalism. <laughs> it's not my name, but you know, this like really going, I need to consciously choose in the same way I chose minimal shoes and minimal furniture. I'm also choosing minimal digitalism um, mm. in our, in my personal life in our family life. Um, and that has its own set of steps. Um, how do you manage that with your kids? Because I that know. is oh, so We should do a whole prevalent. podcast on just that. Yes. And I know parents have such a challenge managing that. And it comes from also the example, but when you're not with them or they're seeing other kids, you know, using it significantly, then naturally they want to gravitate there. Yeah. I mean, that this is its own podcast and it's always, a, it's always a, like, I have to set the, like, no judgment here. Like mm -hmm. parents, we've, we have no role models in this whatsoever, right? Like everyone is parenting through this completely unique environment without warning. You know what I mean? Like you just stepped into it and, and there's not, a, again, a, with those good use practices, there's not even like what we, where we had other things, like we've been around different types of drugs before and alcohol and cigarettes and like, but we sort of came into parenting as people had already been dealing with it. There was already um, campaigns and people who had thought about how to talk to your kids about this and that, like all these things had come down. True. 
but not this, right? Because everyone's sort of like, this is all amazing, you know, or a round of smartphones for all my friends. And so, so when everyone's sort of enthralled with the new thing, it's really hard to imagine what's going to come 10 years down the road, but here we are. And so now we're starting to see things like, okay, we don't even want to introduce these until a particular age, you know? So, so I guess to answer your question about what we have done, keeping in mind that my children are almost 11 and 12. So they are differently aged than people who will be answering this question for older teenagers or younger children is, I mean, one, just not having them, just not having them, um, Mm -hmm. is, and, and delaying the start time. And then that's, of course, the, that's sort of like abstinence is not always the easiest (laughs) answer. So trying to, and I'm, I'm trying to work on a longer piece about this because it needs to be a little bit more well thought out. But some of the things that we have done was when the phone is so poorly named because it is not a phone if we look at time spent using it. We keep calling. No, no, it was a phone 14 years ago. Now it is so many other on unlim- bottomless things, right? That's I jokingly thing. call I jokingly call it another organ. It's it's like a <laughs> lung, but I guess the thing is one of the things that's so challenging is it's bottomless. It can be anything. And how does I am 47 and my strength, my internal metal in different situations, my willpower, my ability to choose what's best for myself at 47 is a challenge. And I'm, Mm. and I, you know, have good mental, you know, strong health physically. I've got strong mental health. Um, I've got lots of resources, um, to read, you know, I've got all these things going for, for me. And I still feel it challenge, feel challenged to, you know, to walk through life, mm-hmm. make, you know, always choosing what's best for me. I can't imagine giving that exact same thing to someone who's 10 mm. or 12 or, you know, like for me, it just seems like I just try to keep describing it. it. It's so easy to call it a phone and to say everyone else has one. But when we talk about what it is. It makes it easier for me to maintain my resolve. Um, And then, again, the practicality. My kids, just like I did when I was their age, want to talk to my friends all of the time. That is also completely a natural thing to do. So Mm -hmm. we got a landline. Right? Like we just went and and other friends got and and shared with our community. Again, it's community. We open with community. It's the same thing. So many of these things require having a community that that's on the same page as you are. And so it requires that uncomfortable dialogue having and, and, um, getting, getting together with people and going, my, my, it can't be just me raising my kids. Or if there's two parents, it can't be just us raising these kids. We need allo parents. Like we need a broader community. We need more families and friends and a school or a school district that can support some of these things. And then it's like anything you have to advocate, you have to advocate for the way that you see the world and listen to other people advocate for the way that they see the world and then try to find, try to find the medium, you know? Yeah. So how do you manage these conversations and and building of that environment? Because I'm not going to lie. I have to say that even within the community that I am in and having a lot of people who are conscious about all these concepts, when I go to the supermarket and walk two miles to get my groceries and bring a backpack and carry a watermelon <laughs> back, people think I'm absolutely insane. Yeah, I know. I'm there so with you. It can be a big deterrent. And at the same time, I also realize what a huge privilege it is for me to even have the time and the ability to be able to do that in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, There are days when, 
you know, I absolutely cannot manage because there are too many, too many things on my plate. And I know that a lot of people, you know, are living like that for the long term. So how do we reconcile all of that and still do the things that we need to do to build that nutritious movement and that community into our lives? I don't know how to solve that entire problem. Or rather, I would say that the way I solve it is by doing what I do, mm. like by, by talk, by break, by writing, you know, by breaking down movement and by offering lots of differently shaped solutions, um, mm-hmm. is the only way that I know how, um, to deal with the fact that, the broader, like, so now we're talking about the broader environment. We were talking about the environments of our home. Mm. Now we're talking about something that's more about the way societies are shaped. And, and certainly there are just straight up the way cities and towns are shaped that makes yeah. things yeah. right. So there's so many levels to this. And I do think I, I do, I try to do a very good job at representing all these layers that you're talking about because it is so easy and very common in health spaces to boil the problem down to you're just, you just need to try, like Mm. you just need to do it. You just need to try. And certainly there is ultimately this, I need to make a choice in one way or the other. But I mean, that's the thing about barriers and obstacles and hurdles is some of them are bigger and more fixed than another's. And so just constantly addressing those through my, through my, my own work, through examples and trying to point people. I mean, there's so many organizations like America walks, for example, is an organization completely dedicated to city design you know, and this idea of mobility justice, this idea that we should be in a space that would allow us to walk or roll or use some sort of, not use a car essentially to get from point A to point B without, without fearing a life, you know, Mm. like not being run down by cars, you know, it's so many people again, depend on it's not only for people who want the fitness. It's also to recognize that there is a very large population that depends who does not have a choice. Should I take the car or should I walk for my health? There's, there's only walking, you Mm -hmm. know, there's, and, and so it's just, I am a big supporter of those organizations that are really trying to do that work and then put those conversations on display for other people to start thinking about. And, um, participating in not only for themselves, but again, on that community, on that community level as well, because we do not have a strong enough community period, but we also don't have a well-developed community that centers or considers movement because it's such a brand new thing Mm. to start considering. You know, I think more people would be more tolerant to, you, I mean, just even the tolerance, I'm laughing at the word tolerance, to people who are gluten intolerant. It used to be a joke, <laughs> right? Like, that was a punchline. Those people were a punchline. Yeah. As, as having all this extra, these extra needs or whatever. And then, lo and behold, you know, here we are 20 years later. And so there's a lot more accommodations made through more understanding. And so the more we understand sedentarism and the way everything's sort of set up to make it harder to move, then the less, I guess, fringe the choices of walking to and from the store would be <laughs> like, it would just be <laughs> like, it's so, I just, when you hear it's fringe again, this is just a, it's, it's good. It's good to travel. It's good to go to other places in the world where you just sort of go, okay, right. The way we feel about stuff is based on what we've seen in yes. our, in our lifetime. And so the smaller, the less you've been exposed to the more radical everything. Yeah. Seems. And I grew up with that framework. So right. when I, you know, heard you speak about it, it wasn't earth shattering right. to me. Right. Um, but I know that for a lot of people it is. 
Um, but talking about barriers, go ahead. go ahead. Well, I just wanted to point out too, um, I had done um, another talk such as this and with other people who were not from North America, who are coming from countries for which the solutions that I was presenting for North America were like, these are our traditional right. practices. And I, you know, there's a lot of, I think, validation, but then also like, I feel like in order to assimilate, I had to get rid of all of these things that Very I was true. already doing because they felt backwards. And I, and I, that right there, I've been trying to work on something for this particular group of people who, who now, who are like, how do I, how do I um, explain why these elements of my culture that I want to retain and not only like retain, but like fully embody and display, like, how do I explain to them that they are also solutions to the same problems that all my friends are complaining about, you know, like, how do I, how do I get into this new environment and thrive? And, you know, arguably it's easier for me as, you know, someone coming from this North American culture say, Oh, just do it for your health. But then there's this other group of like, in order to fit in, I had to like get a car, you know, or just, so yeah. I, I think, I just think that those, those are really necessary conversations not only for the people who are talking about it, but for everyone to listen, you know, for everyone to hear and to recognize and support. Yes, and that assimilation happens not just in terms of the individual actions of like getting a car, for example, but also the fitting into the system, whether it is, um, well, not always by choice, most of the time, because the system is what it is, like right. not having close family around and not having an environment where there's a lot of contribution and community. So you do have the time and the ability to do these other things that are playing into your health um, that you don't when you become, you know, the the, the family with just the two parents going to work for eight hours a day, then coming home and you're the only two that have to take care of the kids and make dinner and clean the house and, you know, um, do the rest of the social activities that you may want to do. It, it is just a complex system that you come in and you assimilate into that environment as well. And some of those actions end up changing by default. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, again, going back to the barriers, I work with a lot of people who have a lot of challenges in terms of chronic conditions. So movement um, may be something that they want, but it can be very difficult to accomplish, either because of limitations or because there is pain involved or in a subset of people because the, the movement itself and the exertion causes something called post-exertional malaise, not just with movement, but also with other things as well. So how do you, um, how do you focus around these people? What is your advice? How do you go about helping them engage with movement in a way that is safe and in a way that um, does offer improvement rather than setbacks? Starting small, I guess, is the easiest way to say it. And the small could be in terms of time that you spend, you know, like start with short duration. It can be uh, low in the sense of intensity. I think for so many people, the definition of exercise is so bound to intensity that someone will be seeking, like it only counts as movement if, if it's intense. So just getting up to take a short walk wouldn't necessarily count. And so what's the point of doing it? Because it's too small to actually count. So starting small could be just doing something for a little bit, could be doing something a little bit and at a lower intensity or longer, but at a lower intensity. Or it could be, I do a lot of part by part explanation of movement where you're just sort of, you're sort of exploring the way your body works through 
movement and the movements are not intense um, and the movements are subtle, but they are a good starting point for, I think of it as like, if you haven't flossed your teeth in a long time, you know, to floss your teeth is this big deal when there's been a buildup of you not moving the muscles in there for a long time and you can get bleeding in the gums and all sorts of things. And so people really resist flossing because they don't do it regularly. And it's the same thing with moving their hinges. So I really like to uh, differentiate between whole body movement, like that's moving your whole person from point A to point B, up a flight of stairs, uh, to your car, from your car to your, like, those are whole body states, even mm. like getting, getting on a bicycle or, or uh, doing a Zumba class, whatever, like your whole body is moving. But again, I'm a biomechanist. So I look at the way hinges and levers are working and I can see people who are quite active are still not moving all of their joints. Well, there's like these sticky sections to their body that even though they're getting a lot of whole body movement, they are not distributing their movement throughout their body very well. So there's these sedentary areas that live with inside their body. Similar, different, differently, but also similarly, people who are not active can also have, can also work on just declumping, declumping some of those sticky parts. It doesn't have to take a lot of whole body movement from point A to point B. You can do a lot of things just sitting in one place, standing in one place, lying on the floor in one position, and then slowly explore the way some of these joints want to move. And that's another really great place to start because you're not, the chances of you getting into that malaise situation are very low. If you're going for a short duration, small intensity, or just sort of doing these corrective exercises throughout your body, you're not, it's, you're not, it's, you're not going to easily trigger post-exertion because you're never really getting it. You're, you're, you're not really exerting for the most part. Now, you know, with the caveat that so, certainly some people can exert themselves doing the smallest thing. So you're going to scale what I'm saying to yourself, right? I'm not saying that anyone walk a certain rate, move a certain volume. It's just where you are right now, wherever that may be, think of adding a little bit of volume mm. and then, and then you can scale it. That's why I try to never give block recommendations. Cause we are all just starting from where we are starting. Yeah. And then, and then you are building up, you know, it's, it's a habit that you're like, when we build up habits, when we change habits, there's a whole brain thing happening, but then there's also our tissues are not really prepared well to move when we don't move often. So there is this strength gap. I'm going to call it a strength gap, but it's like a period, like there's the state of your body before, and then there's a state of body after you move. And there can be discomfort in between if you make too big of a jump. So the idea is to make these small changes. So that you never experience like a tremendous setback so that it disrupts the, the, the mentality that has to go into making that choice to do it again, right? If you, if you start too big or too hard and you have a setback that almost reinforces, see, movement isn't good for me mm. every time I try to move. And so we want, I want to always not set someone up to have that process happen in their mind. So it's all about, there's, there's certainly always a discomfort that's gonna be associated with movement. We all perceive discomfort um, differently, but like even if you're a regular runner, even if you're like a triathlete and you do lots of big movements, you might have a different, you might not call it discomfort, but your heart rate adjusting and your, your all these things happening to you physiologically with the onset of exercise, for some people, they experience all those things. It's going through the filters of their mind of what movement was beforehand. Previous experiences, like almost like trauma response, right? Like you start to you start to 
filter movement through that. And so we need to have a different relationship with movement. So we go stepwise. It's like, it's like any sort of relationship work that you do psychologically dealing with people that are challenging. It's like smaller doses. You have some parameters, good boundaries. And then what happens is you get yourself into a, a loop where you're able to master those situations a little bit more and you can go through them with less dread and then you choose it and then it pays off and then you choose it more often and you go from intrinsically motivated, extrinsically motivated, I'm sorry, to intrinsically motivated and you're doing it because then you just feel better. Yeah, great. Um, so outside of, you know, going too fast, too soon um, type of situations, is there such thing as too much movement? <laughs> well, um, I think that there's, of course, there's always going to be some, uh, something, some movement that is too much. I could easily come up with a situation where you're moving too much for a particular situation, but, and are you still talking about this, your, the specific population? No, in just mind. in general. Yeah. So outside of that population and outside of, you know, someone who has been maybe sedentary for too long yeah. and just went too fast and, and, and got hurt or way too uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing as moving too much? Well, certainly. I mean, there's, I mean, even movement can be drugified right? Like there's been the drugification of movement. There are people mm. who use movement just like everything's been drugified, you know, really. Um, we can go into that more probably another time of what that means, but where you, I guess it's the easiest way to look at it would be if your movement is blocking you from meeting other needs, then that is too much, right? Like that would be a general um, way of looking at it. Now I said movement is there's the whole body movement and there's part by part movement. A lot of times I was talking about those sticky spots that are sort of sedentary right around those sedentary spots in our body. When we are active, the areas surrounding that sedentary spot tend to be over moving. That's what instability often is within our joints. So in that case, that too is too much movement of a particular area. And for many people, they need to learn how to stabilize certain parts so that it's like, it's like if you've ever had, if people have had children or worked with children, it's very challenging when a child is learning how to do something because it's so easy to step right in and do it for the child and the child never learns. And then here you are always stepping in every time the kid needs to do a task. And so the solution for that is to back off, let the kid sort of fumble through it until the kid has mastered it. And now look, both of you can go on and do your own work. But in our body, mm. we have a lot of these parts where certain areas have never developed the skill and other areas or parts keep stepping in. And because and I'm just going to call back to what you're asking about. What are some of the problems with modernity? I think pace might be the underlying cause. Like everything is so fast. We have to do things so quickly. We have to do a large volume and we have to keep doing more and we have to keep doing it faster or we're choosing to do it faster. So when we're trying to move so quickly through life, there's not a lot of time to slow down and let these other parts fumble through their less coordinated movement and sort of step back. And, and that's what I like about corrective exercise or sort of doing what I was talking about, where you're walking through your body and learning how to hold some parts still by other parts move because it pays off for you in the long term where all of your parts are sort of matured and are capable as opposed to having some parts that don't fully like they're still sort of adolescent parts. And then you've got parts that are just sort of <laughs> worn out like a friend, like a frenzied parent, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like we're doing too many things. We got to slow down, do less and let these kids take on a little bit more work. Mm. So that's, that's something maybe also for the over exercisers to look at. There is a subset of people that, you know, are very, 
sprout, rightfully so. They have a lot of discipline. They uh, go to the gym or they do a certain activity and they exercise every day. But their exercise tends to be of one particular type, Mm -hmm. Um, whether you're a runner or you are, um, you know, weightlifter or you're a climber. It tends to be focused on one area. Um, So how can they expand that and make sure that that movement happens throughout? So think about yourself as having a movement diet, right? So the thing that you're talking about is the mode. A lot of us are drawn to a particular mode. And so that's what cross training is about is like, it's really challenging, like pursuing a single mode, even daily as your only type of movement can still leave you with injuries. As strange as it sounds, it leaves you with injuries, but it can also leave you under moved. Mm. It leaves parts of you under moved. And so it's like, if you were just to try to eat a single food, mm. Every single day, even if it was the most nutrient dense thing that you could find, because of what nutrients are, they like the ch- the challenging thing with the nutrient. This is part of movie or DNA too. The challenging thing with the nutrient is having two. Like nutrients are about the context of all other nutrients, and that only eating a single nutrient will not make you super healthy. It will make you sick. So, so nutrients, dietary nutrients, like mechanical nutrients are about the context of all the nutrients together. And so when you have a single mode that you do to a lot that you, that you stick to primarily over time, it lends itself. We call them muscle imbalances. You can call them overuse injuries. Like these are the languages that we're using, but what's happening is your mechanical nutrients are not being distributed well throughout your body. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to back off of the thing that you do. It means that you might need to supplement with other, other things throughout the day and not necessarily supplement with more exercise, but just Mixing up the way that you sit when you're taking rest, walking more and driving less. Like you don't have to be pushing into that intense zone of exercise, but movement is very broad. And so it's this idea of you need more um, low intensity, continuous activity that that uses different shapes of your body and therefore different muscles and joints than where you spend the bulk of your time. So whether that's sitting in front of a computer or maybe you, um, you have a labor intense job. So you're actually working quite a bit, but it's in the same position or same Mm. narrow positions that you would want to look at taking rest in other positions. Like just think of yourself as a constellation, your body's in a constellation and be like, what shape am I spending the bulk of my time in? Because there's plenty of people who actually labor physically. They're not actually sedentary, but they are using a very narrow range of their body still. And so that sort of disrupts the narrative, like that all it takes to be healthy is just to move more. That's not really what we're saying. We're saying dial in your movement diet so that you're not eating too much of any one particular food. And certainly some foods you can eat quite a bit of, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's not to say that you need the same amount of all foods because you don't need the same amount of, you don't need the same volume of oil as you do leafy greens. But there is a right amount for each nutrient and the same goes for mechanical nutrients too. Yeah, and we do tend to take a reductionist approach. It's easier, it's faster. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, the standing desk. So people are still sedentary, whether you're sitting or standing, because Mm -hmm. you're in the same position um, all the time. Yeah. Um, So Katie, you're a very accomplished author um, in this space. You've written many books. How many as of now? I don't know. Nine or 10. (laughs) I don't remember. I don't remember. I think it's a little bit more than that. It could be. I know my collection is quite big. (laughs) Thank Um, you. So if you were going to start someone um, on this concept of movement and moving more of you, 
which book would you pick to get them there? I think if you are already a, a regular exerciser, you could start with Move Your DNA. And I think if you are an emerging mover, or if you're dealing, or or if you're in either group, but you're dealing with like musculoskeletal things or other sort of um, parts of your body that are already are not working well that you'd like to address first, then rethink your position. Those those two books together are a really good set of taking you through the part by part and then introducing you to the idea or the concept of a natural movement framework. Wonderful. How about for parents? Parents who want to get their kids on the mm -hmm. track of moving from the very beginning grow wild so grow wild is my my book for for kids and families and then also just anyone who wants to understand their own body now through the lens of how they grew up um, or just for anyone who holds space for kids that can be teachers or any health professional you know who deals with children to just be thinking about their mechanical environment, giving a critical eye to the mechanical environment, which is something we have not been trained to do yet. Mm, wonderful. And um, how about the older generation? Where should they start? Dynamic Aging. So <laughs> Dynamic Aging is a great book, um, especially if you want to look at movement from this idea. I mean, we are, we are all aging. Like everybody ages. Like that's just what's going on. But Dynamic Aging is told also with uh, my four co-writers who started moving their, they're all had exercise practices, but they were all in their seventies and, or like late sixties, early seventies. And they were, their movement diets weren't robust overall, even though they were regular exercisers and, and looked on paper, like so many of um, us do, at that age, like here's the things that are broken and here's the things that need to be fixed or altered. And they started addressing their movement diet at that age and started to get those parts moving again that were sort of stuck. Um, and it tells about how their next 10 years went. You know, the fact that they actually became more active, more flexible, did more challenging things. And so, it's to disrupt that idea of once you're older, it's all a decline physically. They were good examples and still are. They still are. I guess it's been five years since that book was out. So now we're 15 years into that journey. And um, it's good. It's good to have role models and it's good to see people actually doing it, you know, as opposed to just me. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and there are so many little things that people don't even think about that can be incorporated. Just mm -hmm. like having a manual coffee grinder, um, you know, something that is just so simple that you can do daily that brings more movement into your life um, and can help. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it takes us back to the slow. You know, I talked about that speed thing. So many of these changes are going to be like, I can't do that. I have, I don't have time. Like, I don't have mm. time. So the nice thing about the book Grow Wild is I'm really talking about this idea of stacking your life. It's like when we go slower, we can choose better activities to do that meet more needs at once versus trying to meet one need at a time. Because that's where that's that's what we're running into right now is we've we're so parsed out and away from from nature where everything is layered as far as. Uh, needs met per time that we're trying, we're struggling to try to catch up and there's no way to catch up. We can't extend the period of the day. So we have to go more slowly and choose more uh, thoughtful activities. And then it's possible. And it's less stressful too. And it's more joyful. It's more, it's like, it's like, um, it, we're trying to increase the nutrient density of each mm -hmm. moment in time. What are some examples that families can do that? Um, well, so if you were, I mean, if you were concerned about not connecting with your kids as much because they are off doing other things, they're inside so much more often than you were as a kid, you'd like to see them out more often, 
they're not they're not eating as well as you would like their spines are all curled over looking at their device it's like okay well especially now i'm not sure when this podcast will come out but it's the beginning of north american summertime the idea of throwing a picnic blanket out in your backyard mm. or on your patio or on your front steps and making a little picnic of just the food you were going to make for dinner anyway mm. um, and bring it outside to sit down and eat it as a family, you know, or, or with their friends. Like I will even do this, just throwing it out and snacks are outside. Or when I, when my kids were younger and I still do this, when they come down and they're like, what's for breakfast or where's breakfast? It's like, it's outside. So I'm up before them. And so they have to go outside to do the thing that they must do, which is eat all the food in my house. And then they're outside now. And you made that transition for them. So instead of letting them come down and plunk to where the bowl resides, which is only 16 feet, why would they ever go anywhere? They don't, there's nothing about the environment that makes moving or being outside natural anymore. So if you throw the food out there, they go out there, they didn't, you didn't have to plead, cajole, beg, demand. They didn't have to, they want breakfast. They're not gonna fight with where it is. They just walk outside and guess what? You won, they're outside. They did it. And the chances of them staying there, because again, we're, creat we're lazy creatures who wanna conserve energy. They're gonna stay out there. Throw some yeah. games out there. Throw a book out there. Go invite a friend over. Um, you know, just so like if you just make it so that where they end up is in those places where you want them to be and ultimately their physiology needs them to be, it makes it, it removes a lot of the nagging. Like I'm all about low nagging, low conflict parenting yeah <laughs> parenting in that way you know just yeah. set it up so it's a celebration set up it's like magical like if if your parents made you a a picnic that's magical you know um and it, it just is. takes throwing a sheet a dirty blanket doesn't matter it doesn't have to be i'm not talking about fancy in a picnic basket i'm not talking about that i'm just talking about just not putting it on the kitchen table because that's always where you put it break your mm. own habit you know? Yeah. And those are the things that build the greatest memories that well, you know, as adults, you go yes. back and look at and you're so appreciative. Yeah. All the moments that I actually remember from my childhood are the things that were a break from the routine. Yes. And so it's not about the expense. It's not because they were expensive or grand. It was like they were just not the norm. And so mm -hmm. you can make special celebrations with no money and no time just by doing something that breaks up a routine a little bit. Yeah. One of the things I did with my youngest one was walk him to his friend's houses. So, and it was a great it. time to catch up and have some conversation, you know, mm -hmm. on the way and build some movement and build some time together. So all of that is met just by replacing, getting them there in a car by walking together. Yeah. So that's great. I love it. A lot of pulling them from the road so they didn't get <laughs> run over by a car. But... You still have to parent. You still have to yes. parent. But, <laughs> but I guess it's the thing is like, if you're looking for the work-free solution to get your needs met, that doesn't exist. Exist, right. And, and, I, and I think that's like, we're just like, well, when is it just going to be easy and happen to me? Never. Okay, mm. next question. Now yes. what? Okay, so, so once you realize that you were looking for the work, that you were looking for it and that there it is, it's here. And that there's always a whining phase, whether it's your kids or your partner or your friends or yourself. Once you get yourself over the whining phase, because the whining phase is just the way inertia works on the other side of the wine is, you know, the spirits of life. Like you got, you got to get over the wine hump. That's inevitable. You're not mm. doing it wrong. If you get the wine, you might be doing it right. <laughs> well that is a great place to end katie thank you so much for this time and for you know bringing your expertise in this area and uh quite frankly all of your wisdom to our audience we really appreciate it oh thank you for ha I, having me i i love 
talking to this community and I always love talking to you. So. Oh, thank, Again, thank you. you. Likewise. <laughs> Where can people find you? Um, nutritious movement.com is, is like the house for everything. Um, on social media, it's nutritious movement. And if you like podcasts, um, because you're listening to this, the movie or DNA podcast is a good place to, to explore a lot, a lot of the nuances, um, to be found in movement, but well, you might be able to move while listening. Yeah, I highly, highly recommend it. It's been an amazing resource for myself, and I know that a lot of people will uh, find the same thing in it. Yes. Yeah, thank you. thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.